Can everyone hear me? Yep. What does that last lecture reveal to us most? To me, it reveals something very important, and that is that we've been sold a myth for about 200 years, a myth that specialization is the key to progress, to productivity, to creativity. Specialization. In a way, I agree with that statement, but my definition of specialization is markedly different, and I'll tell you why. We've been told that in order to maintain and progress in a career, in order to make progress in science, in art, in humanities, in order to progress in academia in general, we need to take one small aspect of reality called a field or a discipline, and that we must delve deeply into that aspect. The problem is, of course, is that we know that that one aspect is not reality in its totality, is it? We know that actually it has multiple facets to it. We know that that reality itself, that field or discipline, in its own right is going to evolve into something completely different in one way or another over a short period of time or over a long period of time. It will constantly fuse, clash, connect with other aspects of reality to form a new reality. This is the evolution of creativity, progress in whatever field you may choose. Now, how did this outdated idea of specialization, which is that we must each just focus on that one thing at the expense of everything else, where did that come from? What is its evolution? Well, it has sociological, cognitive, economic, and philosophical origins. I won't go into all of them in detail, but what I will say is that we were told that actually the mind or the brain is wired to focus on one thing at a time. Well, that is true, but that is not the complete truth. Great works by the likes of psychiatrist, philosopher, and neuroscientist Ian McGilchrist, who looked at the synchronicity between the two hemispheres of the brain, which one which is supposed to foster specialization and the other which is supposed to foster creative, holistic thinking, that research showed that actually what we need to do is rethink what the human brain is capable of and what it can do when it brings various fields together. Also, we must remember what kind of world we live in. What is the current economic paradigm? What is the current philosophical paradigm? How does that manifest in institutions such as the one you're studying in or any other institution in the world? Well, this division of labor spoken about by the professor prior to this talk is a division that not only exists in academia or in the sciences, it exists in almost every walk of life. In the workplace, when you get a job, if you have a job, you'll realize this. Most employers do not encourage you to venture beyond your so-called field or your profession. They have a very particular definition which they require you to stick to. They, if you go into academia, even when you start school, many of I'm not quite so sure about the primary school and secondary school structure here, but I know in much of Europe and indeed much across the world, it is a pyramid-like structure where you have your start off with a broad-based education system and you're funneled off up to the top of the pyramid, encouraged to specialize in one field by the time you go to university. And then when you go, to, uh, go on, if you do a master's, you're encouraged to specialize even further. And then, based on that uh, specialism, you are then recruited. How specialized is this person? I will recruit them based on that. And then once you've entered employment, you're encouraged to specialize even further, as if that was the way you are own that's the only way you're going to survive in that profession. Now, the world is very different to what it was in post-industrialized 
Britain, Europe, or even the world. We no longer have to focus on the division of labor as being a means for effective productivity. We're now looking at creative solution to very different problems, complex problems, multifaceted problems, problems that require you to look beyond your so-called specialism, connect dots, inject new insights, draw in from new sources of inspiration. That is what's needed today, not just in the sciences or in the world of technology, but in the world of business, in the arts, indeed, visual arts, the literary arts, performing arts, in the humanities and social sciences, absolutely. In fact, we should question why we call something the humanities or something the sciences or something the social sciences. Does that codification have a value? I would argue yes, but to an extent. So we must be conscious of why we are codifying a particular field or a particular discipline in the first place. So I would argue the true specialist in today's world, as exemplified by Leonardo himself 500 years ago, is not the kind of specialist we are told to be today. The true specialist is actually what I would call a polymath. A polymath is an individual, much as described in the previous lecture, someone who is exceptionally versatile, who is able to move between uh, seemingly different fields and disciplines, often making contributions to each of them. And using the knowledge, the insights that one gains from each of these disciplines to generate new insight for a particular problem or a particular challenge. Now, how can we foster polymaths today, in today's society? In a society that is incredibly hyper-specialized, in a society where subjects at schools are segregated from one another, in a society where different aspects of our lives are governed by a certain set of rules and are placed within certain boxes, how can we break out of these boxes? And actually, do we even need to? Or is it just something that one does for fun? No, I would say. This is absolutely necessary. This idea of multidisciplinary, multidimensional, holistic thinking is not just fashionable, not just something interesting, but something absolutely necessary. Let me go into why. In the future, now, not too distant future, we will be tackling very important challenges. As I said, all of them will be multidimensional by nature. However, these challenges, one core challenge is the challenge of machine intelligence. Machine intelligence, from machine intelligence, comes many de technologies. It has many repercussions for the human. But one of the ones that we're already feeling today is automation and computerization and how that's affecting the labor force, how that's affecting employment, and what prospects does that hold for the future of employment. And then a, the, from that stems an even bigger question. The future of humanity, what value will the human have in the age of super intelligent machines. What value will the human have? Well, I spoke through my research to a variety of futurists and technologists, some of them pioneers, actually many of them pioneers in their fields, and they all recognize this conundrum. And they all realize that the human being will have to revert to his or her primordial self that sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? If we're going into a complex new era, why would we have to revert back to our primordial self? The original man or woman. Well, the original man or woman was inherently complex, inherently multifaceted. We were not dumbed down by a hyper-specialized education system. We were not dumbed down 
or we were not restrained or constrained by an economic system based on exploitation and the division of labor. Original human was built cognitively, neuropsychologically, sociologically, some may say spiritually, to deal with complex challenges. We were originally holistic thinkers. There's been much study on this. I won't go into it in detail. But reverting back to that kind of mindset, what does that allow you to do? It allows you to do something very important for the resolution of future problems. And that is view each problem in the context of the wider picture. The wider picture being as big as you want to make it. It could be, for example, if you're, if you're working on a, on, on a solution to a technological problem here, how does that affect the institution? How does that also then affect the economy of this country? How does that affect nature and the burgeoning issue of climate change? How does that affect then our wider understanding of the cosmos? We can go as big as we like, but the point is that we must add a very important ingredient to any investigation, which Leonardo da Vinci himself was a master of doing. He was a master of injecting context into every single line of inquiry. Firstly, asking the big why. Why am I investigating this? What consequence will it have for humanity, for this individual? for that geographic space. What is it actually solving? What is it actually doing? What is it connected to? This philosophy of perpetual connective thinking is known as systems thinking, which many of you would have heard of. Systems thinking has seen a revival in recent times because of its relevance to this highly complex, interconnected, multifaceted world we currently live in. So, Finally, what I'd like to do is ask you, or pose, actually, a very important question. But before I do that, I want to talk about the question that I'm addressing today. Is the era of specialization over? A resounding yes. It's over. We no longer live in the post-industrial age. We live in a very different world. But specialization, as defined by that post-industrialized world, is over. However, the era of the polymath, who is the ultimate specialist, for the reasons I've explained, the era of the polymath is here. And I ask you all, what is the value of the human? I'd say, the value of the human lies in the future of the polymath. Thank you.